Okay, here we are again. I just want to say a couple of words about translation. So we're still in the world of the text. So we have to talk a little bit about how we go from um, the Hebrew or the Greek into English and what kinds of decisions your translators make. Those of you who know um, second languages know that it's not always easy to translate thoughts from one language, whether it's French or German or ASL or whatever it might be into another language. And so that is what the translator does. That's why you have your English Bible is because a translator has done the hard work of making that move for you of translating the Bible from Hebrew or Greek into English, usually Hebrew when we're talking about the Old Testament. So, um, world of the text translation. So what we did in our last lecture was we looked at what was the process that got us to the point that we could even have an English translation. And now we're gonna talk about that final step in the process of how we got the words on the page of the Bible in English. So, um, so we've got a couple of different choices here. I'll make myself little so that you can see this better. When a translator comes to a text, they can do a variety of things. Um, they may choose to do um, a translation that is really close to what they find in the Hebrew, or uh, and that would be formal correspondence, or they might try to be a little bit more loosey-goosey and try to make it more understandable, or they might just put put it in their own words. Let me give you some, um, some more explanation here. So if somebody is going to do a formal correspondence kind of translation, then they're going to take the Hebrew, I'm holding up the Hebrew again, even though I'm tiny, and they're going to do a word-for-word -word translation from the Hebrew. So where you may find things in the text um, like strange word structure or strange sentence structure, so they may kind of like Yoda, put a verb first, try you will, or something like that, the formal correspondence people are going to go word for word every time, translate it exactly like it appears in the Hebrew. And one of the nice things about this is that it keeps the Hebrew literary devices. So what the Hebrew author is doing, you also get in English. But sometimes it can distort meaning. So for example, um, when you read about the rainbow that appears um, in the sky after the flood, the Hebrew Bible says a bow appeared in the sky. It doesn't say rainbow. It's talking about like a bow and arrow. So like that bow part appeared in the sky. Your word for word translations are not going to be like, oh, I know that they're talking about a rainbow. So I'll just write rainbow. They're going to keep bow there if that makes sense. So it can distort meaning sometimes. It doesn't go that extra mile of making it readable for you, um, but it does stay very close to the original. Some examples are the King James Version and the NRSV. Those ones are gonna be formal correspondence. I'm going word for word every single time. Another thing that you can do as a translator, instead of doing a formal correspondence, you can do a dynamic equivalence, which is you're, you're going to translate a little bit differently. Let's look at this. So you're gonna go meaning for meaning instead of word for word. Instead of translating bow in the sky, you're gonna say rainbow in the sky. Instead of doing a weird sentence structure where the verb is first or something like that, you're going to translate that out to try to make it easier to understand. Um, the whole idea of dynamic equivalence is to make the text easier for your audience to understand. You're going to explain idioms and metaphors. Um, trying to think of one. So, like for example, when um, when Isaac puts his hand under his dad's thigh, you might explain that out and be like, "Okay, they're doing a ceremony." Um, he ceremonially, ceremonially put his hand under his dad's thigh, um, something like that. You're gonna give a little bit more juice and it's gonna be easier to read. So a lot of times also, the Bible, because it's an ancient text, instead of saying all people, we'll say all men. This is something that we used to do in our culture. So we'd say mankind instead of humankind. And now it's, a, it's more acceptable to say humankind so that you're gender inclusive. So um, 
a dynamic equivalent is going to use gender inclusive language whenever possible so that you kind of get that meaning of, oh, right here it means all people rather than just men. And it's much more accessible. It's going to be easier to understand dynamic equivalents. That's like the NIV. So if you have an NIV or a New Living Translation or a Common English Bible, those are all dynamic equivalents. The final one is paraphrase, and a paraphrase is going to update the language quite a bit um, and change it, and usually it has one author versus translators. It's very accessible. Um, an example of that would be the message, and so if you've ever read from the message, then you know that it really puts things very differently. It's very com conversational and very accessible, which is one of the nice things about it. All right, so some examples. Um, I'm not gonna read through all of these. You can, of course, do that if you want to, but this is just an example from the message of the very accessible language. It doesn't sound at all like your version in your big red Bible of Genesis 11, and you can kind of see how the author, Eugene Peterson, has taken all of verses six through nine and just kind of skunked them together to create something that is very conversational and very easy to read, which is helpful. All right, now, here's an example of, well, what do we do with gender inclusive language? It's not necessarily even a question of like, oh, I want to be politically correct, but it's just a question of, well, I want to get the meaning across right. So um, this is from John 12, 32. Even though it's from the New Testament, most of these examples are, I think you'll get the point. Jesus says, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men to myself. Great. Um, but does that mean just dudes get drawn to Jesus? So the NRSV says, you know, back then they said all men instead of all people. We're just going to put all people. So as for me in my house, I prefer the all people because then we don't have to have anybody asking like, oh, does Jesus only love men? Um, because we might ask that men in our society. I don't know. Um, but some people do prefer the men translation because it sticks with what we have in the original language. Now, here's where it can get a little bit sticky. So um, we've got in Proverbs 1.8, hear my son your father's instruction and you know proverbs was written at a time when only young men received an education and so they were the ones that got instruction the nrsv seems to understand that um proverbs is not just for young men any longer but it's for all people and so instead of hear my son the nrsv is going to put hear my child because they think that that is the meaning of the author that this is something that's applicable not only to little boys but also to little girls i don't know do with that what you will um it gets a little bit trickier in some places because for example um we can't really tell in First Timothy if the author has in mind that only men will be bishops because the author is going to use male language no matter what, right? Whether the author means all people or just all folks with male genitalia. We just don't know. And so the NRSV has made a choice and says, okay, I'm going to leave the masculine language in there right? I think that that is what the author meant to, that the author had in mind that only men can be bishops. The Common English Bible is not so sure. Maybe the author was just using a male pronoun um, like we do with mankind when really it means humankind. So you can see that those two are a little bit different and it kind of gets at this debate. Your translator is making decisions for you even about whether or not women can be bishops, which is a little bit little wild. Um, should your translator make that decision for you? I don't know. But you can kind of see that the translator makes a lot of decisions here. They get to decide whether they put um, gender inclusive language or not, and a variety of other things, how they're going to translate rainbow. Um, then we've got Romans 16.1. Um, Phoebe is referred to as a diakonos in Romans 16, and I know this is New Testament, but it really illustrates this well, and that just means deacon, and deacon means servant, and so your translators 
this first one of the NAU is going to render diakonos as servant, which means that this translator probably doesn't think that women can be deacons, even though the text says diakonos. She is a diakonos. Here, um, your translator is going to write deaconess, which is just kind of a feminization of deacon. So the, I don't know what that means, New Jewish Bible maybe, um, is going to be like, yeah, women can be deacons, but I'm going to make it sound more ladylike. And then the NRSV is just going to say deacon, because every time the translator of the NRSV translates deacon, or diakonos, they just go with deacon, and they never say servant. So you can kind of see there's, um, your, your translators are biased. Um, whether they think that women can do certain things or not uh, makes a difference in how they're going to translate certain passages. I'm not saying that is a bad thing. We all have biases. That's just the way it is. It's going to help you to know that your English Bible has been translated by somebody with a bias so that maybe you can do a little bit more investigation and kind of get back at what the original text says and maybe what the author meant. Okay, so other times we don't have to ask whether or not we should do gender inclusive language but sometimes we just have to ask well what do the words mean um so sometimes um you get to a place where the bible does something weird and it talks about unicorns so here's your unicorn for you so my friend texted me one day and was like, oh my gosh, Anna, the Bible talks about unicorns. Do you think they're real? And I was like, no, they're not real. Sorry for spoiling all of your dreams, but unicorns probably aren't real. Um, but in the King James Version, in Numbers 24, 8, it talks about a unicorn. Now, by the time we get to the New American Standard, the translator has taken unicorn out and put wild ox instead which I don't know which one the author had in mind, but, oh, and maybe you could put um, rhinoceros there too. But the problem here is that the Hebrew has this word rame, where the translator is putting unicorn or wild ox, and nobody knows what rame means anymore. It's a Hebrew word that we're just like, I don't know what that means nobody knows. And so when you look at the Greek translation in the Septuagint, it says monokeratos, and that just means one horn. And so your translator was like, well, I don't know what rain means, but I do know of creatures that have one horn. So God brought them out of Egypt. He had the strength of a something with one horn. Ah, yes, a unicorn. And now that seems kind of silly, but sometimes we don't know what the words mean. And so your translator is just making his or her best guess at what the word means. So um, wild ox, is that better than unicorn? We just don't know what rain means. And we don't know what one horned creature your author had in mind when they wrote rain or monokeratos. So sometimes your translators are just like, I'm going to put this in English the best way I can but nobody knows what it means. All right, then finally, sometimes we're just not really sure how to translate a word because we don't have a similar one in English, and the best example of this from the Old Testament is the word hesed. Hesed implies a certain kind of love, so it's this long-lasting promise covenantal kind of love that God gives to God's people. But in English, we only have one word for love, and that's love. And so what do we do? We need like some other words to go along with it. So you can see different translators translate hesed in different ways. It can be steadfast love, loving kindness, great love. Um, it's just one of those words that we just don't have an equivalent for. Um, sometimes it gets translated mercy, grace, or covenant love, and any of those are technically right. It's just that we don't have a good equivalent in English. So all of this to say that when you open your English Bible, somebody has translated it for you, and they have made decisions for you, whether they have decided what kind of animal Yahweh is like, whether Yahweh is like a unicorn or a rhinoceros, or what love means, or whether or not women can be deacons. They have made decisions for you, and you need to be aware of that, um, that they are doing some of that work 
on your behalf. So now what I want you to do is go to the discussion board that's linked right below this and answer some questions for me about translations and how you're going to think about them now in light of what you have learned. All right, thank you. I can't get it to stop. I almost had it and then it went away. Now it's back up again. Ayo. All right, goodbye.